Hi, welcome back to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. We talk a lot about a meta model in personal growth here on the podcast that we named the HAT model. Or actually, a friend of mine that was a coach introduced me to this model, I mean, over a decade ago. And it was so intuitive, I immediately began sorting all of my personal growth work into one of these three categories. We did an entire podcast on the HAT model a while back, but I think that we want to dive a little deeper into this concept so that you, the listener, if this is something that is intuitively and instinctively accurate to you as well, you can start using it to sort your personal growth work uh, also. So we recommend that you go back and listen to that particular podcast. We'll go over the model a little bit, and then we'll do a bit of a deeper dive in a series of podcasts this time to talk about all the different arenas of life that you might be able to understand your growth work while applying it back to this model. So HAT stands for Healing, Achievement, and Transcendence. And the coach that introduced me to this model effectively said that Every time we're doing growth work, we're doing growth work that is either healing work, achievement work, or transcendence work. And healing, achievement, and transcendence are very different styles of growth work. And so it's important to understand what you're doing because each of these categories requires different circumstances in order to be effective. They have a different relationship to growth work. So doing a bit of a deeper dive into the relationship each of these categories has with growth allows you to create the right context, to be in the right frame of mind, and to look for resources and tools that are appropriate for where you're at in your timeline. I just think of a car. I think of taking into a a shop to have work done on a car. There's different things you can take a car in to have worked on. You can have the engine repaired if it's broken. You can have it augmented and made faster by increasing maybe the, I don't know, the gas intake or something to make the engine more extreme and can drive faster. So you optimize it. Or you can alter it significantly. You can transcend the original design of the car, maybe lift it up and put bigger tires on it, change the carriage and the way it's decorated and painted all sorts of colors. So I know that's a metaphor of a car. It's not a human. (laughs) It's not a person that's healing, achieving, or transcending. But healing is kind of like taking your car into the shop to have it mechanically worked on. There's something wrong with it. It's got to be fixed. Achievement might be optimizing the car, putting a faster engine in it, or maybe a better fuel injector. And transcendence might be making that car into something unique and different than it once was. You know, again, lifting it up, putting bigger tires on it, or a low rider, you know, turning it into some expression or something, transcending what it originally was designed as into something new. And so I think that's just a quick little metaphor that I like to think about when I'm thinking about this, because it's like, oh, yeah, I guess personal growth, if I'm if I'm going into the shop, quote unquote, to work on something, it's going to be kind of in a similar vein. I'm probably going to be healing from something. I'm going to be augmenting or adding to my achievements and trying to make things go better for me. Or I'm trying to transcend something and alter how I see reality or frameworks and have a new way of seeing the world. So in this short series, we want to take each of these categories and dive into them a little deeper and talk about, as mentioned, some of the circumstances or the environment or ecosystem or the context that you want to create in order to give it proper due, in order to make sure that you are in the best space possible to tackle that particular growth work in that particular arena. I would also say that society at large is probably socially in one of these places too. Mm. Like you might be in one place and society itself might also be somewhere else. Yeah. Well, and society goes through cycles just like we do. Yeah. And interestingly enough, when society is in one of these cycles, people who are individually not in that cycle will oftentimes have a clash with the rest of society. And so we do things like we point fingers or create make wrongs because everybody else seems to be in one area, but we're in this different arena. And and it's really easy to, I don't know, like when somebody else is on a different moment in the timeline to judge them. If they're behind us, we judge them that they're not as sophisticated as we are. Or if they're ahead of us, we judge them because we can't see that they're ahead of us because that's one of the challenges of being human is that we always believe that we're at the acme. We always believe we're at the highest level of, of humanity. Even if we don't, 
we don't speak as if that's the case. We don't talk as if we're at the Acme. There's still a part of this that believes that we are, right? Like, like we doubt that other people are seeing things that we're not seeing. So when we're in a different uh, groove or place than the rest of society, it's very easy to, to judge and then be judged as well. So let's take the first component. Let's just take healing and talk a little bit about what healing is. I think that this is one that might appear the most obvious. And in fact, I suspect that a lot of people, particularly at this time period, conflate almost all growth work with healing work. And one thing we mentioned in that original podcast many years ago when we filleted out the HAP model is that uh, we can get stuck in one of these. In our minds, we can conflate This means growth work. And then when we're ready for one of the other categories, not allow ourselves to graduate to those other categories because this has become our definition. We can also find a comfort zone. We can get into a place where because this is how we've always thought of growth work, now we're comfortable doing this kind of work. And a different style might get us out of our comfort zone. And interestingly enough, it becomes a bit of a bypass. It becomes a growth bypass where we stay in this one category over and over. And I suspect that that happens with healing. So to define healing, it's basically any time we're dealing with a trauma or something that is, uh, well, like your car metaphor, Joel. We take our car in a quote unquote healing way to the mechanic because if we don't address it, it's going to break down. It's something that's keeping us from being able to drive the car the way the car was designed to be driven. It's something that's wrong. It's off. And if, it can, if it's allowed to continue, it will be on a downward trajectory. And healing work is very similar to that. I think of healing as, or the physical component of healing as a really great metaphor for all of it as well. There's some traumas that are temporary and momentary and uh, heal themselves quickly. Like when you stub your toe or when you poke your eye. That's a, that's a little mini trauma that happens to your body. And the body is designed to almost immediately go into repair mode. And so it might hurt like the dickens at first. And it might even take a couple days. But eventually it's fine. Then there are traumas that are massive and major. Like a massive car accident. Or something that really harms the body. Or broken bone. You know, maybe you say uh, uh, an accident leads to broken bones. Well, you can't just let the body handle that. If you do, the body won't know to reset it self. And so it will try to heal, but it will heal in a way that messes up the rest of the system. So healing is a wide category. And that physical component of healing or the way of understanding healing when it comes to the body also gets carried over to other categories. So a a couple podcasts ago, we talked about using cognitive functions as a map, a way to sort of understand different arenas of our lives. And we talked about the sensory piece being physical, the intuitive piece being more of a sen- uh, spiritual component, the thinking space being more of your uh, psychological, and the feeling space being more of the emotional. So we're just going to borrow that as the four primary categories of our lives. And healing work can take place in any of these. It's interesting that uh, we tend to think of certain c- categories of healing work as belonging to achievement or transcendence. For example, if you're going through spiritual healing, sometimes we mistake that for transcendence work. Or if we're going through psychological healing, sometimes we think of that as achievement work. And and spiritual healing could be something like deconstructing your faith background and reevaluating what you really believe. That may or may not be transcendence. That might be just you're healing from some trauma that you experienced there And there might be some transcendence that comes later, but at first it's usually a a healing process. Well, and I would argue that the way that you know it's a healing process is because it causes pain. Uh, Achievement and transcendence work isn't usually highly painful. It's usually highly uncomfortable. So at what moment does discomfort become pain? And with healing work, the challenge with healing is that it always comes along with pain. Pain is actually the signal that healing needs to happen. And it's the signal that healing is happening as well. If you go through physical therapy, if you've gone through a car accident or some other terrible accident and you have to go through physical therapy, the therapy of getting to the, the place where you are as close to where you were before as possible, that is an incredibly grueling, painful uh, process that requires a lot of patience. It's very frustrating. It hurts a lot. It feels like it's never going to go back to the original. 
And and sometimes you can't. Sometimes you can't go back to where you were originally. Sometimes you're just doing the best you can to get to as close to baseline as possible. And so it's a very painful process. And usually that high level of pain is how you know that you're in the healing category. So the physical component, of course, is one. And that can be anything from something happening to your body that caused a trauma, like an accident or something to that effect. It can be something that's underlying. You've always had it. And it's something that you just have to deal with and mitigate. Oftentimes, if you have something that has been with you throughout your entire life, uh, something that's a pre-existing condition that really um, modern medicine doesn't have a way to, to, to transcend, right, to graduate from, that healing work is something that you have to tap into on a regular basis just to make sure it's managed. But oftentimes, once you're at a baseline of what you can do considering your circumstances, then from there on, you, you enter achievement and transcendence. And you might be in pain all the time, or it might be something that causes pain on a regular basis. But that doesn't mean that you're stuck in healing. You can get to a place where wherever you as an individual, considering your limitations or the things that you're dealing with throughout your life, when you get to a place where you're at your personal baseline, then you're no longer caught or trapped in healing work. Healing work is when attention needs to go in that direction. You need to be focused on it. If you don't, things will get worse. Traumas are usually something that that require attention in order to not become worse. You know what I find interesting is that at this time period in history, we have in the public consciousness this idea of mental health. And we have seen healing work as no longer just physical, but oh, it's emotional and mental too. That's what we mean by when we say mental health. And there's an opportunity now to address some of these issues of, of emotional and mental healing and these kinds of things. And the interesting thing, though, is you would think society putting more focus on this would add clarity to all of this. But what's weird is I see it actually getting more confusing. Society's attention to this makes it really confusing to know, well, what is actual trauma here? What is real hurt versus synthetic hurt or lower level hurt? There's a hierarchy to hurt, right? Physical body, let's just take this. If I cut my finger on a piece of paper, I get a paper cut. That's a very different experience than getting stabbed by a knife. Like both are cutting into my skin, but those are very different injuries. Those are different traumas to my body. One will probably take care of itself. And unlike the car taken to the mechanic, our bodies have a built-in healing mechanism to them. They are self-repairing, which is kind of cool. And the paper cut will probably just heal itself. It could get infected. It could become a problem, but most likely it's just going to heal on its own. The knife wound, the likelihood of that healing on its own is much less. I probably have to go to the hospital, have that worked worked on. And that feels very clear to me. I think most people would agree, oh, that's very clear that one will just take care of itself. The other you should have checked out. But when it comes to the emotional mental stuff, I think it starts to get a little more fuzzy. I think it's hard to know, well, what's real trauma? Like, like I got upset by something somebody said, is that trauma? Is it my my parents treating me mean as a child when I didn't know any better? Is that trauma? Is my religious upbringing and the, you know, the 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 forcing my mind to think in certain ways is that trauma? Like, how do we know what trauma is in these more abstract places, the internal places like our minds and our emotions? I think that when an individual is easily triggered and has a lot of hurt. Uh, on things that other people or onlookers would say, that's a small thing. Why are you why are you getting so triggered? Like, why are you acting like that's a big deal? It almost always points back to uh, an underlying trauma that hasn't been addressed. Like, I just had a Twitter conversation with somebody where we talked about getting offended. And we were discussing that we almost always are offended when we're in a place of... Uh, of like basically a uh, lack of resource where we're under resourced where there's something going on with us and you can see this physically a small uh, affront to the body can be uh, wildly wildly disproportionately painful if a person already has an infection underneath it so take for example a hangnail you know, I, I smash my finger a little bit or I hit it against a door jam, say, as I'm walking, you know, into a room. And if everything else is fine, I might go, ow, and then it's over in 90 seconds. But if I have a, an infection that has come from a hangnail, right, bacteria got in there and now there's an infection going on, and I hit that infected finger against a door jam, 
I might be blinded with pain for a couple minutes. I might not be able to be to, to even be able to register my environment. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> and so when little things cause disproportionate pain, that is usually a symbol that there is something going on under the surface that might not be related to the offense, but needs to be addressed. And I think again, using this concept of physicality, and we're and we are we're going to use this metaphor of physicality to bring it into the spiritual, the emotional, and the psychological, including things like mental health. But when it comes to physical pain or trauma that needs to be healed from, there's I think there's like basically three primary categories. There is the the idea we already talked about, which is accidents, right? Like things that cause trauma that were unintended, or maybe maybe they weren't accidents. Maybe somebody attacked us, right? But it's something that happened. The environment came and got us in some way, right? Whether it was intentional or unintentional, yeah. And it was a it was a uh, a smashing of our physical bodies or a uh, uh, an interaction between our physical bodies and the outer world in some way that caused hurt and damage. Then there are pre-existing conditions, things we're born with, something that might be hereditary or genetic or just something that happened while we were forming in the womb. And those are the things that that require us to address our physical health, but they're not going to go away or at least they they won't go away without medical intervention of some sort. Usually it's mitigation, not healing. Yeah, exactly. Or like science sometimes catches up and is able to help heal those you know, like a, like a, a person who has hearing loss, there's a percentage of people yeah. with hearing loss that cochlear implants can solve that problem. Um, but then there's a percentage that don't. And so uh, so it's like it's one of those things where it's like it's just it's part of what you have to deal with, like a like a muscular dystrophy or maybe type one diabetes or something like that. And then there's a viral and bacterial attacks. things that attack our body that are effectively foreign and you know these little foreign bodies. And then they cause sickness and they um, they attack our bodies and our immune system has to handle those. And so uh, so these are three primary ways that we experience physical trauma. And I would argue that these get brought over into the other categories in a spiritual way. Sometimes it's just an accident like uh, our our spirit or soul is interfered with by something in the outside world, maybe a religion one was raised in, or an ideology a person has, a paradigm. And who they are in essence, and by in essence I mean like essentially, like like the the nucleus or the core, the marrow of the soul, is in a situation where the spiritual food they're being given or the spiritual context that they're in is a mismatch for them. And the, the outside world doesn't know that because that form of spirituality is just existing outside, but they might have been forced into it, like maybe, re, again, raised in a religion or a paradigm or a worldview. And it caused trauma, right? It hurt them because it gave them messages that they're not good enough or that they're bad. Um, a very traditional Judeo-Christian message that causes some trauma that a lot of times people have to overcome this message, even if they end up staying with their religion, is this idea that you are corrupted, and that just by existing, you're bad and wrong. And that is that, that causes some trauma for the soul. And regardless of whether or not you believe that a person is in a corrupted state and required some sort of propitiatory sacrifice or whatever, like whatever the belief system is outside of that, this idea that I am not acceptable as I am, you know, just on a, on a core level can cause some trauma for people. And there's a, a need to do some spiritual healing around that. In an emotional way, or or actually staying with the spiritual piece, there could also be a pre-existing condition. Like I, I think um, sometimes I wondered if I have like a quote unquote spiritual precondition because I struggle with spirituality and always have. It's like a it's there's a there's an automatic skepticism that comes up, and so it's harder for me to tap into a spiritual place I've observed than other people. Now I work extra hard because I know that when I do, then uh, I'm rewarded. But there's a piece of me that kind of has this like lack and, and always has. And so I, I sometimes wonder if that's like a pre-existing condition. And, and it does ca cause some trauma. Like there's trauma there when I see other people tapping into a spiritual place. I feel envy. <laughs> and I'm like, I, I want that too. I want to be able to tap into whatever they're tapping into. And so I've had to use, you know, different. I've had to use tools that are almost like spiritual medicine that other people maybe haven't had to use. 
you know, like psychedelics or, um, you know, drumming journeys or, you know, pretty intense spiritual practices in order to get to a baseline of spiritual health. I'm just getting to a baseline. Other people, they're in a transcendent place. Me, I'm just getting to the baseline. I think when it comes to the emotional piece, oh, excuse me, sticking with spirituality, I forgot the third category, which is viral uh, or uh, bacterial. There can be uh, spiritual attacks that we experience. Um, these bodies outside of ourselves and one could call them like low vibration energy something that comes for us I know this sounds super woo but I mean I I don't know how you know you the listener experiences this or you Joel experiences this but uh, I mean just a couple days ago I was in this horrifically foul mood and nothing was okay and everything you said Joel was just triggering me like crazy and it was like uh, it was like I was in this space where uh, everything was bad and wrong with my life. Everything was bad and wrong with everything. And then within half an hour, I get a phone call from a family member that uh, has a tendency to tear me down in every possible way and has been cruel and unkind for a long time. And, uh, and in a way where it's all tied to spirituality. Like, uh, like, because we have differences of religious beliefs and differences of spiritual perspectives. So I feel like this person, through the lens of spirituality or with the guise of it, creates an attack on me on a regular basis. And, and sometimes I can almost feel it coming on an energetic level. I know that sounds super woo. But it feels sometimes like I get sort of energetically attacked by outside forces and entities, and it feels viral. It feels like a bacteria or a virus that attacks me. Absolutely. I think I experienced this too. And I bet if people were really examining their lives, a lot of people have this experience of something else that's going on that's not mental, emotional, or physical, that's causing disturbances in the force, quote unquote, the force of your life, whatever that is. And I think those are spiritual things. I think there is there is a sense of energy around us. I mean, there's vibes at sports games. The reason why the home, te- home team advantage works is because there's almost a a spiritual intention that's created by a crowd of people that helps the home team win a, f- a football game or any other game that they're playing at home. It's just there's something that's that's beyond our understanding that's not emotional, mental, or physical. And we see it all the time. We just It's hard to get a hold of it. It's so ethereal. Yeah. Well, a football fan might say, no, it's because they're used to the stadium or because the fans are louder when the other team is playing and uh, setting with, up their play. With COVID, though, it's, <laughs> it skewed it when, when the crowds weren't full. Yeah. It, was, uh, it really did affect the gameplay. It was weird. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think, I mean, I think it's definitely a note in the system for sure. So, uh, so the last component, or excuse me, that last component of it being sort of viral or bacterial, I think on a spiritual level, you have to use similar tools as you do on the physical level. When something is an accident or if somebody you know, aggressed you and hurt you physically, uh, you need to take time to give your body a chance to heal and you have to go easy on yourself. That's usually the the best thing to do. And if it's traumatic enough, like a broken bone, you need to seek assistance to reset it. And I think these three categories of how trauma happens can be extended to the emotional and the psychological as well. Yeah. So you can have uh, emotional problems you know, emotional sickness that comes from your engagement with the outside world or your relationships, right? And uh, and maybe you were in an abusive relationship, something that really broke you down emotionally. Or maybe you were just in a context where people invalidated you your entire life and you never felt permission to have your authentic emotional expression. One is more of an unintended accident and the other one is an aggression, just like you can have an accident in a car or somebody can beat you up. But regardless of the intent, the result is the same, that the your relationship to the outside world, your interaction with it ended up causing bruised emotional experiences. And so that would be that would be how that works with the emotional component. But then you can also have a pre-existing condition. Maybe you have an um, uh, challenges emotionally, just sort of in your makeup. Some people are very naturally emotionally intelligent, and others of us are not. <laughs> like we lack emotional intelligence just as a as a as a baseline. Or maybe you were raised in a family that lacked emotional intelligence, and nobody taught you how to do it. So the pre-existing condition there, the thing that you have to kind of manage, or, or again, sometimes abusive contexts will do this too, is that they rob you of the ability to show up 
with any sort of emotional sophistication or agency or agency exactly um you've been uh, that bruised and battered that can happen in your in- engagement with the outside world well sometimes context will highlight for us some of the natural lack we have in the emotional arena. I mean, some people are dealing with challenges that are, we call them mental health, but they're emotional health. You know, maybe a person is dealing with depression that, you know, they've tried all of the other things, the nodes in the system that would help them with depression, and yet they're still experiencing it. Like take, for example, they have good, you know, they've got good routines, they're eating well, they're exercising, they're uh, they're getting plenty of sleep and they're drinking plenty of water and also they're on mission and they've got a great supportive loving family and and they they've got a rewarding career and work and yet for some reason depression follows them right like that might be considered a pre-existing condition maybe it's something that can only ever be managed and uh, and so those are the kinds of ways that a pre-existing condition can show up with emotional trauma and then with uh, the viral attack I mean, I would say the FJs understand this. People who have extroverted feeling or harmony understand this. When somebody else in your life is going through something that is emotionally a downer, you can catch it. You know, if you're living with somebody who has depression, sometimes it feels like you're depressed because you're just slurping it up and it's almost like a virus that you caught. So uh, these three categories can extend to the emotional and then they can extend to the psychological as well. Same deal. You've got uh, you've got the the abusive situations or maybe just situations or contexts where your engagement with the outside world dumped a bunch of bad programming into you. Like your beliefs, all these limiting beliefs you have, all these beliefs about who you are, the beliefs about the world, you might be highly cynical or you might think that everybody's out to get you or you might be highly paranoid. Or, or you're censored, like you're not allowed to say what you think. You're, you're removed from that ability. Oh, right, yeah, you can't. Uh, and every time you talk about what is true and honest for you, you get dogpiled. And so that feels like you're being beaten up on a psychological realm sometimes. And so whether it's intentional or unintentional, again, it's like that accident, you know, the car accident or being beaten up by somebody on a psychological realm, you can feel that way. You can feel like the outside world is attacking you on a psychological level. And then you also have the pre-existing conditions, you know, like uh, some people might just be dealing with something that they can't control that is mental health related. And it doesn't strike them necessarily in an emotional way. It strikes them more in a psychological way. I mean, some of the worst cases of this is something like schizophrenia. So a person might be dealing with an underlying psychological condition that they can only ever manage. And that's a that's their baseline of health. And then it can be viral, right? It can be a back, almost like a virus or a bac- bacteria. There's this concept of the collective unconscious and beliefs and fads of ideas come through the collective unconscious. And sometimes these are poisonous and toxic ideas that we get. And we just, they, we get incepted with them and we don't even know where they came from. And this is our, now our worldview or our perspective, how we see things. And it's horrifically unhealthy for us. So all four of these categories, the physical, the spiritual, the psychological, and the emotional, all four of these categories can experience traumas in a, uh, in a hitting up against the outside world either with intent or lack of intent, accidents or acts of aggression, or we can have a pre-existing condition, or we can uh, be attacked by a virus or a bacteria. And in all of these, the same thing is required, which is healing work. Now, being able to diagnose which arena it's in and where it came from can be highly helpful. Because again, if it's a, uh, if it's a, a bone that needs to be set... That's a different action than you take if it's an infection and you need to take an antibiotic. Like those are two different actions. Or if it's a pre-existing condition, you need to have a, a modest sense of what you can accomplish and not get stuck constantly trying to make it better, but maybe acknowledge that there is a, there, there's a, a place of management that you're always going to have to be checking in with, but you can also transcend the obsession with it. We will be right back. If you're focused on personal growth, I think you'll resonate with our core content over at personalityhacker.com. We want to see you understand how your mind is wired so you can generate motivation, improve social skills, find career opportunities, and master excellent decision making. But a quick warning, we are advice and action focused in all of our articles, podcasts, and videos. This means that we attract people who like to be challenged to become excellent, to take action, to put in the work to optimize themselves, not simply just gather more information. If you are committed to personal growth, 
and ready to radically find your inner truth, then come over and be a part of our growing community of like minds at Personality Hacker. Now back to the show. I think there's a baseline here too. Like as I'm thinking through, these are all trauma things. A couple, like a bunch of stuff's coming up for me, but I'll just talk about this one. This idea of a baseline. In other words, you take your, your car to a shop, you create a context for repair. You take your, your physical body to either a doctor or some medical professional or, or somebody that can help you heal. You're creating a context for that. And certainly when you're in the middle of physically healing, you're going to do things like getting lots of rest, drinking lots of water. Let's say you have a surgery and you have to heal from that. You're going to try to take care of yourself, dress the wound, stay off your feet as much as possible, you know, recover, basically. I think when it comes to mental health, we, we're not as good about that for some reason. Like we don't think about all the baseline things to support that. So for example, you were talking about this, Antonio. You, I think you'd made a, a comment or someone else had made a comment on Twitter a, a, a few months back about... Are you struggling with mental health issues? Have you done this checklist first? And it was like a checklist of, are you getting enough sleep? Are you getting enough water? Are you getting enough food, the proper foods, proper nutrition? Like, are you taking care of all the things that will support your mental health first and then addressing your mental health? Or are you trying to address it like we do in Western medicine where I've got a problem, I'll just take a pill and hopefully it goes away. Like, there's, it's a lifestyle addressment, not just addressing, not just like a quick fix in some ways. And I think that's that's part of it too, is there needs to be a context and support for this healing work to happen. You can't just do it in isolation. And I, I don't know if we talk about that enough or a lot, I should say. Yeah. Well, and I think that that person actually, I didn't make that comment, but I just read it. There was a lot of pushback where people were like, well, the fact that I have mental health issues means I can't do any of that. And I can understand. I can understand some limitations. Like, I get that. I have I have a viewpoint where I can make space for that. I understand that person that, that would say that. Yeah. Well, and uh, I mean, I think that both of those truths need to be married together. Yeah. To that point, you're so injured sometimes you need an ambulance to take you to the hospital. You can't right. get yourself there. Right. Like you just can't. You need help outside of yourself. Right. Exactly. And uh, and there's also something to be said for uh, if you're not in a place where an, where you need an ambulance to come drive you to the you know to the intensive care unit, if you are in a place where you can manage some of this, I don't think anybody expects somebody who's dealing with mental health issues to have this happen overnight. But it's more like a integrating these components into their lifestyle, and I think the reason why that's important is because when we are dealing with healing or trauma issues, it can be really easy to feel like you're never going to get better because the prescription is as painful as the diagnosis. Like it feels like like as we're getting healthier, we might not experience the ROI of the feeling of health for a while while we're doing all of this. And it can sometimes feel like two steps forward, one step back, or sometimes one step forward, two steps back, and then you have to make up make up for that. Like it's hard. Healing work is really hard work. And that's why I find it so interesting that some people get stuck there as almost a bypass, as like a growth bypass. Because I think the thing about healing is it allows you to, uh, nobody can tell you whether or not you're healed. Unlike achievement and transcendence, and we'll talk about those in uh, um, future podcasts. What's the metric for healed? Well, the metric for healed is that you are at a subjective baseline for your life where you can show up without feeling constant pain. Well, how do you know if a person is feeling constant pain? We don't know what a person's cir circumstances or situations are. Like, how do I know if somebody's dealing with a lot of emotional pain? I don't know, right? That doesn't, that's not something that I can know from the outside. And so healing work can almost become a hamster wheel. And, and I think it's because the progress that is made has latent rewards. And, uh, and you just, it's, it's, it's so difficult when you're going through this process to know whether or not you're even making progress. And so, especially if you're still in pain, which the process, like I'm going to be in pain if I don't address it and I'm going to be in pain if I do address it. <laughs> so how do I know I'm making gain? <laughs> and then when somebody goes, well, you should just do this and this and this, you know, it's like, well, that person is not, they're invalidating the fact that I'm experiencing pain through all of this, right? It's its just yeah. a really hard, it's so hard when you're in the realm of, of healing work to really know what to do and the gains that can be made. I remember my mom, when I was a teenager, suffered from some internal like digestive stomach issues, like severe issues. As an INFJ, this is common sometimes for INFJs to have 
physical trauma. And I think a lot of it was emotionally related, but she did have physical actual issues. And she went to the doctor and as she was healing physically from some of the issues she had, she was frustrated that it wasn't happening in the timeline. I mean, it felt like it was taking forever. And I think the doctor told her this, or maybe she just told me this. You know, she had some realizations. She was really trying to work through this. She said, it took me a while to get sick. Like it didn't happen overnight. It took a while to get my body this place. It's going to take a while to get healthy again. It's going to take time. I have to do this practice over and over again, continue to eat healthy, work on my gut health, all the things that I need to work on. It's going to take a while to get healthy because it took me a while to get sick. Mm. And I think to your point, sometimes we don't see those healing results at first. It might take a while. Our, our Western mindset is that we are sick. We go to the doctor. They give us a pill. We take it. We're better within a week. Move on with your life. It's a very, it's a very like cause effect solution framework. But I think it's holistic. I think healing is, I mean, achievement and transcendence is as well. But healing is probably the most uh, ongoing process. I mean, our bodies naturally heal all the time. So we probably have to kind of maintenance this on an ongoing basis as things go wrong in our lives and take moments to address that. And I think it's a, it's a journey, not a destination of healing. Mm. And I think because it's a journey, I think that's where we, you know, you talked about people getting stuck there and it's not that we're stuck there. It's that we kind of have to be there our whole lives because we're going to have new traumas. We're going to have new, we're going to do a bunch of personal growth work. We're going to achieve, we're going to transcend. And then we think we've got it all handled. We're midlife and somebody says something to us or something happens or a partner splits up from us or some other trauma enters our life. And we have got to go back into healing work now again. And it's probably going to happen over and over again throughout our lives. So it's really building the discipline and skills of how do I heal myself? How do I show up with mental, emotional, physical health, spiritual health in my life? What does that look like for me? And you said it's subjective. It is subjective. What does it look like for me? And when am I going to engage with it? There's a lot of things here. And I think it is a lifestyle of looking at the trauma and addressing it when it comes up, not letting it stack, not letting yourself get sick to the point where you've got to do major things to correct it. Well, anytime a person is in healing, they have to go easy on themselves. Yeah. And... I think sometimes we get stuck here. Like you said, like our, our immune systems are constantly in, you know, they're in a constant battle. You know, it's, it's, it's war inside of our bodies all the time because we're always being attacked by something. And so our immune systems are always doing a form of healing. And so you're, I think you're right. I think we always are on some level, we're going to have to apply some, you know, some real estate to the healing process. But I think the reason why we sometimes get stuck in healing is because uh, we have to go easy on ourselves when we're in a healing time period. You know, it's, you can tell people who are stuck in the achievement element because when they get sick, it's almost, it, it's like they, they just can't stay in bed. They just got to get going. <laughs> like I got things I got to do. <laughs> and that's a person who doesn't heal very well. They don't know how the healing process works. When you're in a healing time period where you're addressing this, even if it's a pre-existing condition, sometimes you just have to go easier on yourself. And I think one of the reasons why we can sometimes get stuck in healing is because we get used to going easy on ourselves. Once you get up to a baseline, it is time to graduate to achievement or transcendence work. But in the meantime, you know, it's like, well, I, 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 I have myself experienced being sick and I probably could have gone to work that day on that last day, you know, that I took off, but it, I had gotten used to sitting around. <laughs> I had gotten used to sitting on the couch watching, you know, like, watching my stories, reading a book and drinking tea. And it was miserable for the first couple of days because my body was fighting off an infection. But then that last day I was like, maybe I could have gone in. <laughs> and so you can see why people sometimes get used to being in the healing space is because they get used to going easy on themselves, even when they no longer need to. That said, you can't know it from the outside. And so a person has to be mature enough to self-assess whether or not they're in a healing time period because it legitimately is required or because they've they've reached a homeostasis and they don't really want to have to push themselves out of it. I think another challenge with the healing context is that, like you said, it is holistic. And so sometimes when we're dealing with emotional problems, it shows up in our bodies. Sometimes when we're dealing with spiritual problems, it shows up in our thoughts and our beliefs. Like it's, or, or emotionally, right? Sometimes when we're dealing with a psychological problem, it shows up emotionally. They, the symptoms are not a one-to-one. -one. You won't always know which category you're in because of symptoms. Symptoms might be throwing you off. 
And that can get really confusing. And sometimes we're stuck in a healing process just because we can't get to a good diagnostic. So having, you know, it, finding a good doctor is a tough thing to do. Finding a good person who will help us deal with spiritual problems or ch challenges or traumas is a hard thing to do. Finding good sources for emotional and psychological traumas. These are hard things to do. And sometimes we can get stuck not because we've gotten used to being easy on ourselves, but because we just can't get to a good diagnostic and yet we still remain in pain. So the, you know, and, and by the way, that whole idea that we can get stuck because we're going easy on ourselves, I, I don't say that as in judgment, right? Like sometimes we just need to go easy on ourselves even if we're not in a really critical, crucial place. Sometimes we just need to rest. And so that's not said necessarily in judgment. And it's also not not said in judgment. <laughs> like sometimes we also need to push ourselves. Well, I think in the past we were given space to heal physically, but even then a lot of times in the past societies were really go, go, go. And I mean, for survival reasons, not even just like ethos reasons, like you just had to get up and go gather food and hunt that day to, to collect. I mean, I'm talking a long time ago. You just had to deal with physical pain, emotional pain, mental pain and trauma and just make it happen. But in our in our modern world, the modernist thinking, especially mid-century, last century, we started to make space for people to physically heal, go see the doctor. Now, I don't think it's holistic medicine necessarily. It's usually Western you know, surgery or pills medicine, pre prescription medicine, but at least we're making space for the physical healing. And I think people had to fight for emotional, spiritual, and mental space to heal. I don't think we have to necessarily fight. I think there was a natural, because you had to fight in the past, I think there was a natural like end point to those. People couldn't necessarily get stuck there because society kind of okay, you got to get moving again. And you you had to fight to create the space for that healing. But that fight was just too much all the time. So you'd get back into achievement, transcend, whatever you're doing, you know. Uh, but we don't have that fight anymore. We do have the space. So I think there's a little bit of a opportunity for people to arrive at a place where they feel stuck there. I think I found myself there. And some of mine was noble. Like, oh, I'm healing. I can't get onto that project. I got to do some more healing work first. Like, I need to go easy on myself, you know, on this whatever or this thing, which again, I'm the only one that can determine that for, for me. And, and you listening, you're the only one that can determine that for you. But I've noticed that I let myself get off the hook a couple of times. Hmm. I was like, oh, I probably should actually, but I want to just heal more and, you know, take care of myself and not push so hard. Why should I push so hard? And I'm realizing that maybe I went too far on that side. Yeah. But again, it's very subjective. It's very nuanced. It's a little bit of an overcorrection. I think we're in a time period. We said we mentioned that society is in a certain element of this. I think we're very much in a healing time period for society, at least in this country, the country we're in. It feels very much like healing. And and in the past, it felt very much like achievement. And there were blips and moments when we flirted with transcendence. But I don't know if society at large has ever truly been in a transcendence time period. <laughs> There's oh. been subcultures, but I don't think... I think we go back and forth between healing and achievement. Probably big like spiritual movements like the Second Great Awakening in the right. in the United States like in the 1700s or 1800s mm. or whatever. Yeah. These are probably like giant spiritual movements. Yeah. And I, and I bet there's one on on the planet now in some ways like there's like a gestalt shift in how people view humanity and the individual and collective groups. I think there is some spiritual at least attempt to transcend some things that we've been burdened by in the past. Yeah, but I think I have a feeling that they get they get misinterpreted as healing movements. Yeah, we tend to think of them as trying to spiritually heal, or at least we do right now. Excuse me. I agree with you, though. I think we have been in transcendent time periods, but we can kick that can to a future podcast. Sure. But right now, I think that we're in a healing time period, and so we have we. I mean, you can see this because if a person gives an achievement message, like take for example a personal responsibility message then there's a lot of pushback against that because it feels like it's being unkind or not taking people's mental, emotional, psychological, spiritual health. Uh, it, it's not taking all of that into consideration. You know, and, and there is something to be said for people in achievement having almost a sense of privilege to be there. It means that they're at a baseline of health. There, that is a nice place to be, to be able to move on to an achievement time period. And so right now we're dealing with a lot of healing and so that there is way more space for mental and emotional healing work. And I would argue spiritual work as well. I, I just realized too, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. I just want to tag this thought that the reason why healing is a lifetime is because achievement and transcendence create trauma in what they do. Like I'm thinking about, you're talking about society on a mass scale healing. I just think about the subject of slavery. 1865, 
Civil War is over in the United States. Slavery is ended. We had a spiritual awakening of how people should be treated at that time. Now, there was a battle over it. Not everyone was awakened to the same fact that we need to treat people differently. And now I think hundreds of years later, we're seeing some healing work still from this. In other words, the, the trauma of that transcendent place kicked off the need for healing that was not addressed up until maybe now. Yeah. And I, it might be a long time before it's completely addressed. But like that's an example of, of trauma being created that we have to go heal from now society-wise. So I'm guessing this happens on the micro level too for the individual. Yeah. If, if I can see it on a big scale, I'm a social subtype in the Enneagram, right? If I see it on a big scale, I'm assuming, okay, that's probably the same on a micro scale too. Yeah, definitely. I, I would agree. Achievement and transcendence. Well, it gets us so far out of our comfort zone that if we, if we do something that's big, yeah, I think it does end up creating some trauma. And so we have to heal from that. So again, there's always a little part of our mental real estate or a little part of our growth real estate that needs to keep our finger on the pulse of where we're at with healing. But we also need to make sure that we graduate beyond healing at a certain point if it's possible. Now, not everybody has that capacity and, uh, and, and I want to acknowledge that. For some people, the healing work that they have to do is the only thing that they'll be able to accomplish over a lifetime. If a person is so physically based on pre, pre-existing conditions or maybe a massively traumatic accident, I mean, you know, there were kids that got polio and were in an iron lung their entire lives. Like what exactly, what, what achievement work were they supposed to do? So there are people who deal with some of these challenges, like, you know, psychological, as I mentioned, one of the most extreme versions of this is something like schizophrenia. What exactly are you supposed to do, right? Are you supposed to go out and achieve and become a transcendent person if you're dealing with schizophrenia your entire life? Like there are some people who their entire lives are going to be applied to healing work and that's appropriate for them. That's, that is their lived experience. That's their story. That's what's going on for them. But I think what's really important about healing is a component of modesty. We need to be uh, intellectually and emotionally honest with ourselves where we're at in this stream. If we have traumas, we need to acknowledge that those traumas require some healing work. If we are experiencing symptom symptoms of a need for healing work, we need to be willing to you know to, to to look at ourselves as having these limitations. I am limited right now in this way. Might not be forever, but right now I'm having these limitations, and I need to address them. And I might need to get some help. I might need to be humble enough to reach out to help for you know from somebody else. Just like I would go see the doctor if I was having physical symptoms. Maybe I need to go see a counselor or a therapist. Uh, maybe I need to go see somebody who has, um, you know, something to say spiritually, right? I need to go seek resources that help me go through this time period of healing. And I think the modesty also requires requires us to not get caught there. You know, like uh, like to be honest when we need to slow down and need, need to be gentle. You have a hangnail that created an infection you have to be gentle on that hand for a time period. It will let you know when you're not being gentle with it, right? It will give you immediate feedback that you have gone too far. And we need to be sensitive to that when we're going through a time period of healing in whatever category we're talking about. We have to be gentle with it. We have to be gentle on ourselves, not have too high expectations of what we can accomplish uh, and, and ask for help again. And then also we need to be honest when we maybe have graduated beyond it. Maybe we are now at a baseline. The traumas have been healed. I took the antibiotic. The infection is basically gone. Now I no longer have to cradle my finger, right? Now I don't have to be as careful with it. Now I can go on to other things. So the healing challenge is really one of self-awareness and self-honesty. And, uh, and, 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 I, I think it's a great opportunity for people to show self-compassion for a place where people can stop judging themselves as much. Most of the time when we have trauma, it wasn't our fault. Sometimes it was, you know, sometimes we're in a car accident because we did stupid shit. Like we were, we took risks that we shouldn't have taken. Sometimes they are self-inflicted wounds. And oftentimes they're not. Oftentimes when we deal with a lot of these healing works, it's just something that sort of happened to us. And maybe there's no make wrong to it. It's just a thing. It's just something that exists. But regardless, uh, we, even if we created the circumstance that caused trauma or if we are on the receiving end of it, or we're a victim to a situation that we, we didn't ask for, regardless of what it is, we need to show ourselves self-compassion and not judge ourselves too harshly addressing it directly is a symbol and a sign that we want we want to get better and we don't want to stay in a place at a stuck place 
and um, and and that time period that we give ourselves for rest and for healing and to you know to to really get to the other side of it is a symbol that we think that we deserve to be able to be at a baseline of health. It's a message we send to ourselves that I deserve to be healthy. I deserve to be in a better space. And uh, and I think that all sorts of rewards can come when we do healing work honestly. Uh, and, uh, and, and you know, w- with that sense of modesty. I like the personal frame you put it into of subjectively reflecting on myself and agreeing that I deserve to be in a healthy place to live my life. And I think that you listening, you could also see this for yourself too. I think right now, because healing is such a, a topic of our day at the time of this recording, it it can feel outside of ourselves. But I think what you did in Tony's, you brought it back to the personal, you brought it back to the self to say, yeah, I deserve as myself, I deserve to give myself the opportunity to live a healthy life a healthy existence, mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, and to be present to that, to be present to a healthy existence in this physical plane or this this reality we all share. And I think that's wise. I think that's a wise frame to go from it because we can get also distracted externally like, well, maybe my healing work for myself is if I heal the world out there, somehow that'll help me in here. And I don't know if it works that way. I mean, that's going to be a lot of suffering. You're going to get to the end of your life and the world will not be corrected out there. And then you just wasted your whole life, like trying to fix something externally that would fix something internally. What if, what if you just addressed it a re, like right, right away, address the cause inside of your own healing work? And then my, my thought of all that is if everybody did that, we would probably all start to heal collectively. Like we all start to look at ourselves and find the ways we can heal personally we start to do that in mass, that is healing it, quote unquote, out there. So I think that's really important to bring it back to the personal. Yeah. Just one note too, before we wrap this up, is uh, diagnosing where you're at means like sort of matching up to the right resources and tools. And if you're listening to this podcast, you probably are a person who's into personal growth. And you, uh, I, I would use what resources you're attracted to mm to help gauge where you're at in all of this. Yeah. Because we, our inner wisdom oftentimes is trying to light the way where we should be going. And it will encourage us to be attracted to the things that are healthy for us. Like uh, that, I mean, that doesn't, that doesn't always count. Like, I mean, take for example, when somebody's trying to get their physical health in order, they might not always be attracted to nutrient dense foods. They might be attracted to like the taste of processed foods or the taste of something that's like high fat, high salt, high sugar, you know, the thing that makes the, it dances on the tongue. But it doesn't take much um, it doesn't take much calibrating to the healthy thing before the body now starts to get disgusted by the processed foods. Like, I mean, every once in a while, if you've taught yourself to eat nutrient dense foods, every once in a while, a bag of Doritos is like heaven sent. But if you eat them on a regular basis, your whole system goes, what are you doing? Like, why are you doing this? Go eat nutrient-dense food. You already know, you know that. So if you're in a time period of trying to figure out which element of healing you're doing or where you're even at in the hat model, oftentimes our inner wisdom is encouraging us to go toward things that are good for us if it's a growth or development tool. And, um, and sometimes we have created habits that have us not reaching out for those things, that have us reaching out for the bag of Doritos all the time. And be aware of that too, because that will also tell you, like if you're instinctively attracted to things that you know are not healthy for you in any of these arenas, uh, then let yourself taste the healthy version for a little while. Do it maybe 21 days. And then see on the end of that 21 days, if the part of you, regardless of if it's physical, spiritual, you know, mental or emotional, if that part of you is like that, that's what I want. Just like the physical will be like, no, I, I want to eat the kale now. I, I know I made fun of kale like three weeks ago, but now I want the kale. So um, so I uh, just be sensitive. Listen to your inner wisdom. It is almost always trying to guide you in the direction that you need to go. So what is your inner wisdom telling you? You've been listening to this podcast. You haven't had a microphone, but we want to hear from you. Come over to personalityhacker.com directly below this episode. Go ahead and leave a comment, ask a question, or more importantly, share your story. Maybe you are in the midst of healing work. Maybe it's been something that's been 
a difficult challenge for you, or maybe you've transcended it, you've, you've, or not transcended, but you've accomplished some healing in your life. And we want to hear what that process was like. How did you give yourself kindness? How did you create the space for it? How did you know when you were finished or at least to the point where you could move on to something else? Because it's subjective. It's internal. We want to hear what your metrics are, how your experience was. This is one of those things that we really do need to hear from people's stories because I think it's so unique and individualized for everybody. We want to hear you. So come over to personalityhacker.com and make your voice heard. And if you enjoyed this podcast, you can subscribe to us on iTunes and various Android platforms. If you leave a rating and review for us on iTunes, it helps us out a lot. And I read every one, so please do it because it makes me feel good. Uh, we have a book. It's called Personality Hacker. And you can get it at all major book retailers. You can special order it through your local bookstore. And if you enjoy it, because you should, because we put a lot of time and effort into it, and I think it's an enjoyable read, leave us a rating and review on Amazon or on Goodreads. That also helps us out a lot. We have a suite of programs that are personal growth oriented through the lens of personality type. So if you're ready to take your personal growth to the next level, head over to personalityhacker.com and under our product catalog, see which one is right for you. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And we'll talk with you on the next Personality Hacker podcast. If you're focused on personal growth, I think you'll resonate with our core content over at personalityhacker.com. We want to see you understand how your mind is wired so you can generate motivation, improve social skills, find career opportunities, and master excellent decision making. But a quick warning, we are advice and action focused in all of our articles, podcasts, and videos. This means that we attract people who like to be challenged to become excellent, to take action, to put in the work to optimize themselves not simply just gather more information. If you are committed to personal growth and ready to radically find your inner truth, then come over and be a part of our growing community of like minds at Personality Hacker.